if I could go back and start my business again now, I would get as much off my desk as quickly as possible, even if that meant not getting paid for a bit. The fear when you're starting in business is that you need to do everything yourself because you can't afford to get someone else. 99% of the business owners I know are thinking about how much money they're gonna make today, in the next week, in the next month. They're not thinking about how much impact am I gonna have in the next year, two years, five years? And when you start making short-term decisions, you start making mistakes. Hey guys, welcome back to the show. Just a quick note from me to say thank you so much for choosing to tune in to watch today's episode. I've checked the stats recently and I was blown away to see that 93.6% of you who choose to tune in and watch these videos aren't already subscribed to the channel. Now, if you're watching these videos because you're looking to level up in your life and make positive changes, it starts by changing your environment and what you consume. So make sure that you're subscribed to this channel so that you're consuming some incredible, inspirational and empowering content and stories that will help you make positive changes in your life. Enjoy today's episode and stay visionary. My guest today is Joel Stone. Joel has gone from being a freelance graphic designer to a trainee accountant to now running his own digital marketing agency uh, co-founded with your business partner as well. Uh, on top of that, Joel has written his own book uh, mm -hmm. called Stay Hungry and hosts a podcast under the same brand. Joel, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Thanks for having me. Now, we have a ton of stuff to <laughs> yeah. go through and cover today because uh, you are a man of many talents and, uh, you know. Maybe. <laughs> tons of background experience for sure. Um, I want to start with your description of who Joel was before the agency, before entrepreneurism, why did you decide to become a trainee accountant? Like what was the mindset of that person? <laughs> Why on earth did you decide yeah. to become a trainee accountant? <laughs> you know, what was the mindset of that person? Talk to me about and help me explain, help me understand who that version of Joel was. Okay. Um, that version of Joel was a little bit lost, I'd say, um, straight out of the park. Let's, let's go with that but the reality of the situation was I as a young kid I was very sure that I wanted to go into like the creative industry mm. so I was really into like Ardman animation and stuff as a kid like Wallace and Gromit and yep. um, the Creature Comforts TV program so mm -hmm. this is like long before Chicken Run and all that yep. kind of stuff. and I uh, just really liked that kind of thing and I used to doodle all the time at home and uh, I applied for a graphic design and animation degree and got on it. And then when I got there, the animation bit of the degree was shit. <laughs> so, so it's I, like, what, three, two, 2.7 years of like the graphic design and one tiny fraction well, of animation. No, I, it, it was just so shit, that bit of it, that I just <laughs> dropped it straight away. Really? I was like, right, I'm only going to do graphic design modules because I, I was like, there is no point in me learning how to animate something in, in what was called Adobe Flash then, mm. when I could already see that that technology was gonna be dead by the time I finished the degree. I was like, this is, I, I, there's no benefit to me here. And I've always been a bit like that, that if I can see there's no road ahead, I'll cut it out. So long story short, qualified as a graphic designer, lived up north, was freelancing for agencies in Manchester mm -hmm. whilst working for a print house in Bolton and it was all kind of going well. Had had a flat, living with my partner at the time, and and my mum got quite ill, and she didn't live up there, and my parents were separated, and I just mm -hmm. thought, oh, uh, I I think I need to go home. Okay. And so went home, um, back in with my mum, took a job that I didn't really want, and just felt a bit rudderless. And mm. at the same time, we were in the sort of back end of the two thousand and eight recession. So graphic design wasn't like, especially in Shropshire, people didn't even know what a graphic designer was. <laughs> so um, I was like, well, what do people always need? They always need an accountant. And I'm quite like an academic guy. I was like, well, I'm not worried about having to do accountancy exams. I'll go do that. Wow. Trained to be an accountant, absolutely hated it. <laughs> but it was a great stepping stone for starting my own business mm. because suddenly I understood balance sheets. I understood profit and loss. I understood where other businesses were making their mistakes. And so that was kind of why I trained to be an accountant um, on the back of like quite a weird childhood, 
which we can go into if, if you want. So. so a couple of things there. Yeah. How did you become the type of person who could foresee that a technology that was being used in that time and space uh, to learn animation was going to become obsolete? Where did that mindset come from? I, um, I just felt like when I was using it, and there was another application at the time called Dreamweaver, which people used to mm -hmm. build websites. And oh God, I remember Dreamweaver. Yeah, so yeah. I was in these two things, Dreamweaver and Flash, and both, I was like, these are clunky as hell. Like, mm. There is no way when the world gets better that these are going to exist in the form that they do. And it, it, I'm not, I think and it was an element of luck, really. I'm not like a soothsayer. It was just, <laughs> it was just like, I cannot foresee that people are going to, it's not economically viable. Like, companies were paying thousands of pounds to produce animations to produce websites that i was like surely when this gets better and i mean now with the advent of ai we're talking seconds but yeah but i didn't know that it was just something that i just had a hunch that there's no way a bunch of graphic designers in bolton are going to be spending three thousand hours in dreamweaver and flash to create an animated banner for a website i'm going to come back to the hunches part of this in a second mm. you said you had quite a weird upbringing mm. and a childhood yeah define weird upbringing okay so um three months before i was born my dad's brother committed suicide um and so my family in their wisdom gave me the middle name mark which is my dad's brother's name right um my dad and his other brother obviously have had a lot of issues off the back of that, a lot of mental health issues, of a lot of struggles. Um, but I carried this like weird weight growing up of like having the middle name of my dead uncle that I never met. And like, it sounds a bit callous to say it like that. And I don't mean it like that, but people would say to me that they reminded, I reminded them of him and stuff. And it was quite odd. It's a strange uh, thing to hear. Yeah, and they meant they meant it with affection. And yeah, I think it was nice for them, but it wasn't great for me. <laughs> so I grew up in in an environment where my dad had severe mental health issues. He took a lot after his brother that had passed, um, and he was in and out of hospital. I was growing up. My mum worked multiple jobs, and there was when my dad was around. There was quite a lot of like animosity in the household. It wasn't it wasn't a peaceful place. Mm -hmm. Like I thought, everybody argued every day. That was kind of my upbringing um, I resonate with that a lot mm, and so there there was some violence there was certainly an awful lot of shouting and things getting thrown and doors slammed um, I kind of found my shelter in school by being a geek and being hyper competitive so like I wanted to win in the classroom but I wanted to win on the sports field as well that was my escape. Um, learned quite quickly that people don't like you being at the front. They don't like you being the first to put your hand up. But had too much blind competitiveness to not do that. Mm. Um, and that kind of carried on as I grew up. So uh, my dad tried to commit suicide when I was 12. Um, Jeez. It's hard to go to school and have everyone tell you your dad's a nutter um, when the night before he's just tried to kill himself and everyone knows because you live in a small community. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually got into a fight that day and I wasn't particularly a fighter. And and uh, because someone was saying your dad's a nutter and I retaliated and he stabbed me with a compass not like i wasn't going to hospital yeah but it's not yeah a fun space but to this be in. was like when i say i had a bit of a weird upbringing some strange things went on had all that going on um kind of grew up on on an ex council estate terrace type road so yeah. some of us owned our houses some didn't but like you can hear what's going on next door so they, i was sort of surrounded by drugs mental health issues this like weird mix of poverty and not lived in an area that was quite well off but we weren't so you go to school and like you come back off the holidays and some kids have gone skiing 
and some kids have gone camping and yeah. it's like that kind of mix and i was always like an in-betweener i seemed to be friends with the people who were affluent and successful but resonated with the people that weren't but never quite fitted in with both and and so didn't really find my place that's i guess like that's the roundabout story um moved on to college as i got older mm -hmm. became very good friends uh with a girl called emily um who had had similar upbringing understood me got on really well and um she she was just like a really good best friend mm. um and i had a girlfriend at the time who didn't really like that because if you've got a girl best friend like you know in hindsight i can see it was awkward for her but there was no nothing to worry about it's just that's what it was um and emily texted me over new year when we were on school holidays christmas holidays yeah. and said oh can can you ring me and i couldn't ring her there and then because i was with my girlfriend and my girlfriend was kicking off and rightly so yeah you know it's a bit weird when i did ring emily didn't answer and when i went back to college it panned out emily had committed suicide and so jesus i'd sort of had a relatively difficult upbringing and then lost my best friend just as i was like learning how to become a grown-up wow um and then i went to uni and just threw myself into being a graphic designer so that's that's what i meant i meant yeah what does joel today take as a key learning lesson or key way of living based on everything you experienced growing up so I'm, I'm like reluctant to come across like I've got it all nailed because I haven't um, and I think that's unfair on people who think that they should have it all nailed um, but when I'm at my best I can lean on some of those struggles as a way of seeing some of the positives um which again is not meant to sound callous but i can i can look at like the struggles i had with my dad and and yet see how hard he worked to try and be well and how hard he worked to try and put food on the table for our family and remember the good things he did even though he had horrendous things going on for himself and then try and reflect that in my own behavior so like when i'm struggling or I'm stressed in the business or stressed with my investments or whatever it might be, how can I show up as the best version of me despite the fact I don't feel very well or I'm very stressed or I haven't slept for two nights or I've been on a long flight or whatever it might be. And I, and I do know that when he was at his best, that's what he was trying to do. Mm. And like the same with with losing my friend at my at my worst it's still devastating the grief never goes away but at my best i think well what would she want me to do in this situation what would she be proud of and try and reflect that in my behavior so if i i, I had a, a situation on the train here today which i don't want to pat on the back for this but a guy came on the train and said has anyone anyone got any money and obviously every, everyone ignored him and he looked a little bit scruffy and stuff and then he said and this broke my heart or oh, if you haven't got any money if anyone can just give me some food and I was like fucking hell like, that's when you know someone really needs something yeah and he, and he was crying as well yeah. it wasn't like he wasn't scrounging and I know nobody nobody that's willing to do that is actually scrounging I don't I don't care what anyone says but when someone asks if you can just spare some food and I literally had a chocolate in my bag and I felt like a dick giving it him but it was the right thing to do and I said to him well, I'm actually I'm actually like not to sound like a knob I'm actually about to go and get some breakfast if you want to come with me we can, we can grab some breakfast and he said oh no I've got to stay on the train but that was me trying to do what would be the right thing to do if nobody was watching not mm. the right thing to do to then come and say on a podcast <laughs> so yeah no I understand um I think everything comes at a very timely manner mm. um, and the fact that you've just shared about your best friend passing away one of my closest friends just passed away three weeks ago mm. and something that you just mentioned is something that's piqued my curiosity massively which is you know the grief never really goes away but you just 
kind of ask yourself in those situations, like, what would that person want you to do? Yeah. And you've said a couple of times you do your best to just show up as your best self. And obviously you've just given a great example of what you did on the train this morning. That's a way that you could turn up as the version of your best self. Yeah. How else do you do that? So I guess as like a, a business owner, entrepreneur, I can't go into our office in the wrong energy. Mm. I can't, like, I might have had a blazing row with my wife, which has actually never happened, so that's a terrible example. But, <laughs> but, I, my, but hypothetically yeah, speaking. Hypothetically speaking, I've had a blazing row, I've got a puncture on the way to the to the office. I don't know, something's happened. <laughs> yep. If I then go into the office and reflect that in all of my behaviour, that will come out in our business's work mm. one way or another. You know, the team might not feel like working as hard that day. They might not feel as motivated. So it's up to me to go in and be like, despite what I've got going on, and, and I've had significant things happen as an adult as well, I can't go into that situation and take that energy with me. Mm -hmm. I, I need to bring my best foot forward. And actually, it's, it's good for me too, that if, if I can compartmentalize and walk into a situation and be like, well, this situation is, has no bearing on what else is going on. So I should bring the best version of me to this. I'm, and it isn't like a fake it till you make it. It's a, what are the best parts of my character that I can bring to this situation to help everybody involved? And what should I leave at the door because it isn't relevant to this situation? Mm. Where you will meet people, and I've certainly met people in business and, and personally, who bring their problems to every situation. And all that happens is their problem then engulfs their entire being their entire life mm. and it pulls their business down it pulls their personal life down yeah that energy can be very destructive yeah and then if that's the energy that you're coming across with 100 percent, it filters through to your team it filters through if you've got clients it filters through to your clients um if you've got family and they've not been involved but you bring that energy home it can filter through yeah to your family life it filters through everywhere yeah 100 um, percent. definitely something to be very wary of is there anything that you tangibly do that allows you co to compartmentalize something that's been done, something negative that's happened? Yep. And being able to put that in a box and allowing yourself to kind of operate at your best version. Is there anything that you specifically do? So the things that I, I know work, and I'm not saying I use them all, all the time, mm -hmm. that would be a lie. Um, but exercise, 100% will give you a bit of a reset mm -hmm. it, it doesn't it's not the fix for everything but it, it will definitely slightly improve your mood slightly improve your mindset slightly improve your physical well-being to him um i have a decompression playlist in the car so if i pull into the car park at work and i'm a little bit wired from whatever's going on just bang that on for five minutes take a take a moment i, I do that every time i pull on the drive at home because the version of me that's in the office and always on and always thinking is not what my wife needs at home when I go through the front door. So pull on the drive. I've had a 25 minute, 30 minute drive home anyway. Mm -hmm. Decompression playlist on, walk in through the door and, and she'll always say, how was work? And, I, and I'll say, if it's been a bad day, rather than saying, oh, it was totally shit, I'll just be like, let's not talk about it let's have a lovely evening and and unless she can see i'm really struggling she knows that that means i've put that to one side and it's time for us time um and i found those like really good mechanisms the it will sound pathetic and annoy people listening but the other one is sometimes bad things happen in the moment so a client doesn't pay or a website breaks or mm -hmm. whatever it might be and it is literally a case of deep breath, control what you can control, but don't allow that energy to seep into everything else. Yeah, I love that. It takes a lot of practice and getting it wrong to be able to master that over a longer period yeah. of time, for sure. Because like in that situation, by the way, I love the playlist uh, example because I might actually start uh, using that just to see what difference it makes for me as well. Uh, but yeah, if you're in the middle of like a work day and a client's website just breaks down for whatever reason. Yeah. Um, the first time it happens, you might absolutely lose your shit and everyone gets impacted. 
The second time will probably be a little bit less. The third time will probably be a little bit less. But then the fourth or fifth time, you might just catch yourself in that moment and go, I need to take a breath before I react yeah, to what's yeah. just happened. Exactly. And like very little of what most people do is life or death. Mm. And I've been either fortunate or unfortunate enough to be in a fair few life or death situations. So when someone rings me up and they're furious because their website's not working, I empathise with that because they would expect it to be working. And, I, you know, it's a rare occurrence. I'm not saying every <laughs> website. But, but I also have to, like, give it some perspective. And it's like, okay, well, we've got the processes in place to check what's wrong. Chances are we can get this fixed quite quickly. If, for whatever reason, this has really impacted them as a business we've got the things in place to help with that too so is me worrying about it actually beneficial to the situation or should i compartmentalize it pass it to the people who do know best and without being blase be hands off and focus on the things i can mm. control and that's kind of when i'm at my best that's how i approach everything i love that why did you start your own business so I, um, partly as a result of learnt behaviour, partly I think because I'm predisposed to it, I've suffered with anxiety and depression my entire life. Um, and I think part of that is feeling like you're out of control. And I've never felt like an employee because I've never felt like I had enough control. And it was it's not like the kind of control where I feel like I need to know what everything is doing and what mm. piece is where. It's more like I've had an idea and nobody's listening. Mm. And that frustration brews into kind of a almost an anxiety itself where you're like, I'm sure this is a good idea. Maybe I don't have the seniority for anyone to actually listen to this idea. But I would, would then feel myself falling back into that thing I described from childhood where I felt like an in-betweener. Mm. It's like, okay, so I'm not in that gang, so they won't listen to me. But I'm not in that gang, so I can't hang out with them. I think I might be a bit of an individual. And I think that naturally led to me setting up a business where I was like, okay, I can definitely make more for myself financially and in like the sense of like non tangible rewards mm -hmm. by working for myself. So why? And then I, once I'd planted that seed, there was no, there was no other option. And and it, even you know when I've had tough times in business, I've gone oh maybe it'd be better stacking shelves in Tesco, which we've all had. <laughs> yep. And then I've gone well I wouldn't because I'd be furious that Tesco's process for stacking shelves isn't as good as it could be. <laughs> so. Just go for CEO of Tesco really. Um, now in your business, um, Code Break, which is yeah. your marketing agency, you've got a co-founder. Yeah. How important has it been for you? to have a co-founder at the beginning of your journey and to go through that journey together because I know there's there's probably a lot of people listening to this right now who are thinking about starting a business or who have started something and they're under the impression that they have to do everything. Yeah. How has having a co-founder been a help to you? And so I actually started in business on my own. Okay. Uh, so I ran a design agency first all by myself uh, I say all by myself not all by myself but I founded it it was mine mm -hmm. and Andy ran a copywriting agency and we had loads of crossover I was doing websites for him he was doing copy for me to the point where it got confusing so seven years in we were like we're sharing the same office this is ludicrous we need to merge but what I would say is the fear when you're starting in business is that you need to do everything yourself because you can't afford to get someone else to do it mm. but you actually can't afford not to get someone else to do it so if you need a bookkeeper the reality is it's because they will do your books in, in a tenth of the time you will and you'll earn more money doing it yourself uh, do, getting them to do it and doing the thing that you're good at earning money doing than not. doing the books yourself yeah. yeah and so if i could go back and start my business again now 
I would get as much off my desk as quickly as possible, even if that meant not getting paid for a bit. I'd just grit my teeth. So that is a very uh, different approach to what most people think that they need to do at the yeah. beginning of their business. How would you advise someone listening to this to take on that viewpoint that it's okay not to get paid initially, especially when you're at the start of the business trying to systemize everything essentially to get things off your plate so that you can focus on the money making yeah. activities. So the temptation is to always think, how do I do this? Mm. And the better question is, who do I know that can do this for me? Now, that's that's the difference between a small business owner mindset and an entrepreneur's mindset, I think. Um, the small business owner who remains a small business owner, I might be happy with that. I'm Which is fair. Probably figures out how to do it for themselves. The entrepreneur who wants income streams that maybe they're hands off on finds out who can they get to do it for the right price in the right amount of time so that they can get on with whatever it is they want to be doing be it growing their business growing another business playing golf whatever they whatever they're into so, so that is the case with I would say employees or contractors or people that you need to pass things on to yeah. with a co-founder and obviously you guys were sharing work. So at that stage, it yeah. made a lot of sense. What have you learned? What would you say? I'm not going to ask you what he's learned from you because obviously that's <laughs> his uh, conversation to have, but what would you say you've learned from him and how it's impacted, how you operate the business compared to what you used to do when you were solo? So he, I had, I was very much small business owner mindset. When, when we met I wanted to know how to do everything mm. he's never been like that never um, and I'd say we have a good balance now because when you're running a business it's very difficult to monitor how well something's going if you don't at least have a feel for how that works mm -hmm. so it's not about being able to do the books but it is about being able to read the balance sheet it's not about in my case knowing all the ins and outs of Google Ads but you do need to know what the difference is between a click and an impression and a conversion and and whatnot. So Andy is kind of, my business partner Andy is kind of definitely more of a big picture thinker in that sense. Um and very much thinking about how much can I get off my desk. And it might not be so I can grow the business. It could be so I can spend more time with my family. It could be so and and I can fall into the trap of I'd love to figure this out. And it's not necessarily I'd love to figure this out to save money. It, it's, I'd love to figure this out to massage my ego that says I need to know how to do this. Yeah. And sometimes I have to rein that in. So it's a good balance because sometimes I'm like, Andy, you need to know a bit more about this than you're interested in knowing. And sometimes he's like, Joel, you don't need to know every line of code on that website. <laughs> Wind your neck in. And that that's worked really well. That's amazing. Sounds like a good balance between the two. Yeah. Why did you write your book, Stay Hungry? What inspired you to write that? And I know um, Andy was a <laughs> co-author on that yeah, book as yeah. well. But so, so why... the even chapters yeah. are rubbish. Just, just read the odd chapters. <laughs> uh, the <laughs> even chapters are the ones that he's written. Yeah. <laughs> um, so when COVID hit, mm -hmm. we, we'd merged. We'd taken on staff. We'd taken on premises. Um, we'd invested quite heavily in the business and in a week, just over a week, we lost 80% of our client base Jeez. and everyone was like, basically, I don't care that I'm under contract, there is no money in the pot and whether that was true or not. At the time, if people really remember to what it was like in the first few months of COVID, we all thought we were going to die. Yeah. So you didn't get into arguments with people about what the contract said. It's not like it was two years later when, you know, we kind of had a better picture of it. And if someone mm -hmm. wasn't going to honor a contract, you'd be like, oh, hang on. Yeah. This was like, we were talking about the morality of life and death. And so when someone rang up in tears saying, I've just let all my staff go and we can't honor the contract, I was not in a position to say, well, hang on, you owe me 20 grand we just overnight lost 80% of our our customers we also were in a situation because we'd only just merged and so it was a fairly new company 
we weren't entitled to furlough or mm. to bounce back loans. So we've got staff that were looking at us going, everyone's on furlough and they're only working one day a week or not working at all mm-hmm. and it's really sunny. <laughs> and, I'm and it's going, really sunny. Yeah, yeah it's and, true. And I'm going, I need you all to carry on working because somehow I've got to pay you and we've got to get through this. So we lost 80% of our clients. There wasn't new clients coming from anywhere in that first six months. Kind of twiddling our thumbs, but paying people to carry on working. Mm -hmm. And a lot of time on our hands. And we always thought we were going to write a book. So we were like, okay, let's work with a coach on book writing. Get this book written. Get it out to an editor. Get get it published and, and see what it does. And that's kind of was what caused the green shoots recovery on the other side interesting so how did you bounce back after that six month period because to lose 80 percent of your clients i mean fair play to the 20 percent that stuck around stuck around yeah yeah, i'll be grateful to them for the rest of my life yeah and some of them you know might not even be clients now for whatever reason but i'll never forget the ones that stuck by us because it was the difference between getting fed and not at the time. Yeah, absolutely, which is huge. Um, so shout out to that 20%. Yeah. Um, with regards to the 80% that disappeared, what was that journey like to recoup that business? I'm assuming not from the same clients, or maybe some of them came back, but more so it was about getting new clients on board. Yeah. So I, there was a stage there where I've never been lower it, it like took it out of me because I couldn't see how we were going to pay the bills. I couldn't see a clear future anymore. And and we were still very unsure what the world was going to look like when we were all let back outside. It was just, I was like, I don't know if people are going to need marketers anymore. I think priorities have changed. Apparently we're all toilet roll hoarders now, so... <laughs> And pasta. Like, yeah, and, and pasta, yeah. <laughs> you need the toilet roll yeah. for something. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, carbs. So we're all yeah. carb loaded, so we need a lot of loo roll. And so we got to this place where I was like, right, I think this might be done. I think I might be done. I don't know quite what I'm going to do. And then kind of muddled by in that mood for a little bit. My business partner certainly didn't feel like this. He he took a totally different approach. But we were like miles apart at the time, mm-hmm. you know, weren't able to see each other. Just weird Zoom meetings once in a while and just odd. And then once I kind of went through that grieving process of what I'd lost, I just suddenly was like, nah, bollocks to this. Like everyone else is going through this too and there'll be loads of businesses out there that don't survive this and that's the biggest opportunity i'm ever going to have in business and like like again not to sound callous or cold but it's like if there's a moment this is it and did some hardcore stuff in that moment so sold my house because i had bills to pay so we didn't put all of the equity into our next house and i'd release some funds to help keep the business going keep myself going that is solid commitment yeah it it sounds baller now because it worked (laughs) at the time everyone thought i was insane so which is understandable yeah but i guess you're the only person that can see what in that situation what needed to be done well i was i I was like i've got to back myself because no one else is going to fine and so did that put some foundations in the business. Andy and I both put roughly 15 grand each into the business. We refurbed the office knowing that when it reopened, people would come in and be like, this is unreal. We put together a, like a a way of attracting leads and wowing them so that we could charge 10 times what we charged before. We knew that we were gonna have a base of a lot less clients charging a lot more, but providing way more value. Mm-hmm. And just completely flipped it on its head. So we went from like a seven-figure business to a near-zero business, back to a seven-figure business in a two-year cycle. And I love it, it. It was wild. 
<laughs> it sounds like a wild ride for sure. Yeah. There's something that you mentioned in between that, which was just how low you felt mm -hmm. during that period of that six months mm. where things just, I, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure for most people, nothing was looking incredible. No. Um, and it was a very shit time and a very scary time for, uh, if not everyone, a large portion of the world. With your background and what you've been through and what you witnessed with your best friend and obviously what you grew up with as yeah. well did you have any moments of feeling that low where you might have had suicidal thoughts or anything like that yeah every day really and i think the only thing that's ever stopped me is i've seen what it does to people seen what it does to families and so i'm we mentioned before about the benefits of my upbringing even though it was harsh one of the things for me is it's kept me alive and that's why it sounds deep, but something I've never discussed, but during COVID, I got so low that I hoped that I got COVID and died. Wow. And because I was so, so deep in the struggle, but I also knew that that was an incredibly selfish thought in a sense, even I've, to, to try and justify an unjustifiable thought I thought I was a burden and therefore hoped I got COVID and it took me. But I also knew that that was a selfish way to think and that people relied on me. Mm. Um, and so, like things that I had going on at the time, so my father-in-law, who, who I get on really well with, um, had been diagnosed with cancer and it was bad and he was having his treatment in hospital but no one could visit him because it was COVID. Yeah. And I had the cheek to be sat at home thinking, oh, I hope I get COVID. Oh, you prick. Like, so I was compounding my negativity sat there. Mm. But at the same time, there was this like, I've, I've always got this like a bit of tenacious fire in me. I like, it's like my, my best weapon and my, and my biggest weakness at the same time <laughs> because I'll grind myself into the ground to try mm. and do something. And so that kind of deep low where I, I was really struggling but couldn't really communicate it to anyone other than my wife who was we'd only just got married and we were forced to live together for two years and not really <laughs> see anyone well did that happen at the same time so, so we got we got married six months before covid yeah oh well, wow nine months before covid so i mean if that's not going to be an indoctrination into a marriage nothing mm, else will the be the biggest test of a marriage yeah. ever <laughs> like, oh by the way i'm massively depressed now and you're stuck indoors with me for the next six months how did Would she... you like a cup of tea? Yeah. <laughs> uh, how did she deal with you bringing her that level of uh, vulnerability of what you were going through? Um, I, I, I'm pretty cards on the table type person. Mm -hmm. So I've never tried to hide the fact that I'm a man of like deep emotion in both a positive and a negative sense. But she is very good at like seeing the best in the world so she like, loves nature she loves the outdoors she loves people although she might argue she doesn't but she does <laughs> um, and so she can often see the best in a situation mm. and for her she's like she would never say something as as patronizing as this but almost like if she wakes up and it's sunny and she can hear the birds singing that is a great day mm. And I've learned so much from that where like I'll wake up and start thinking about like big problems that I can't solve. And she's like taking great joy from hearing the birds tweeting. And yet she's like a far more intelligent person than me. So is, is me deeply thinking about these things that are bothering me? Can I solve COVID? Can I pull this business out of debt? Can I provide for the staff? And she's like, the birds are tweeting, and I'm like, yeah, like the perspective is, is epic, and I, I'm like really lucky to have that, and really lucky to have somebody that doesn't necessarily join me in some of the daft rabbit holes I go down. <laughs> I think that's um, incredibly important. Yeah, um, whether it's your wife your husband your partner your spouse a family member a friend someone who's able to 
offset your negative thought. Yeah. Someone who's able to offset that or not be bought into what that person might be going through. But, and, and also not to dismiss it and not to patronize it and say it's yeah, not yeah. something that you should be feeling, but instead just uh, helping to shift that focus to something else. Yeah. And I think like anybody who's had mental health struggles, they're well aware that their thoughts aren't logical. Mm. It's not like, it's not like, oh, I'm worrying about if I switch the lights off or not. I know that's a normal thing to worry about. That's not how someone who's worrying about that's thinking. So when somebody says to you, oh, like, pick yourself up or, like, pull yourself together, that's not a constructive comment. Yeah. <laughs> Where, like, Hannah, my wife, is is much more, okay, that's how you feel and that's true for you. And she would never say it quite like mm. that. But also, what about this? What would you like for tea? Would you like a cup of tea? How about we go for a walk? The dog needs feeding. The bins need putting out. Like pulls me back to to reality yeah. as such, and like that's so grounding. And and to like long story short, to talk about the book. The day the book got published, so we had this big plan for marketing it, and obviously you can imagine me like I, I planned to the nth degree, yeah. <laughs> like all those traits that we're talking about, positive and negative got this massive plan i can't wait to press go on this marketing plan it got published on the saturday night i knew on the monday that i was going to press go on this marketing plan to, to try and get to bestseller because we wanted to hit bestseller in categories that matter because yep. there's a lot of people out there publishing books in like random categories hitting yeah number gardeners one. that like ufos i'm number one in the yeah. category of one like that's not <laughs> so went to sleep on the saturday night got up on the sunday morning kind of forgot the book had come out and then i thought oh, i'll just check amazon to see if it's live mm. and it was number one in two good categories that's amazing what categories so marketing and web marketing i think that's i, I screenshotted it at yeah. the time and um lay on the sofa hannah's on the other sofa and she's reading a magazine it's like the book's number one in two categories like i was really hyped and much like she is with my negative thoughts she looked up from her magazine, she went, that's good. And then looked back down to her magazine. <laughs> and it was so grounding. Like immediately I was like, yeah, don't get up your own ass. Like plenty of people have done this before. Plenty of people will do it after. Yeah. Now it's your time to go and use that as a tool to help your business. Absolutely. I love that. And congratulations on hitting <laughs> both of those. Um, what would you say is the worst mistake you've made in your business? I've made loads. <laughs> and that's why I specifically worded it as yeah, your yeah, worst yeah. mistake. So if you meet if you meet a business owner that says they don't make mistakes, run a mile. Because mm. you might only see my wins, but for every win I've had, I've made 100 mistakes. I, th I think is a fair comment. The worst mistake I've ever made. I know what... I know the mistake that hurt the most. So um, I asked my brother to work for me when I was still quite young in business ownership mm. and he was brilliant he, he has the same traits as me so he really cares he can get quite wound up and i would say he puts an, an illogical amount of pressure on himself okay and so factor in that he's then also working for his brother who he loves and cares about it like within a week it was he'd like unraveled all right the hell I've taken one of the most capable intelligent people I know and like really upset them yeah <laughs> broken them yeah yeah I mean well he, he, he's a he's a very capable individual so I, I'm sort of careful to say I broke him but <laughs> but I was gutted I was like that really hurt and you know people say I'll never work with family blah, blah, mm. blah, but that's not true like he would have been an absolute asset to the business if I'd have addressed the pressure better how do you think you could have done that better? I think at the time I couldn't have because I didn't know myself. Mm. Where now, it's a bit like the life or death thing. So I'd be like, okay, these are the things that are really important to our business. And if they go wrong, it is bad. However, if you use a comma instead of a full stop in this copy here, it's nothing that can't be fixed. And I don't want you to lose sleep over it. Mm. And that's tricky because in marketing, grammar is important. Yeah. But it's it's not life or death. 
So yeah. that that's probably not the worst mistake I've ever made, but it's the one that hurt the most. I've I've made some absolute clangers in business. I've invested in things that have achieved nothing. Um, I've worked with people who it's panned out their values don't align with me mm. and it's like hurt me i've like one step forward 10 steps back mm. um I'm, I'm careful to mention specifics like i'm trying to think of something that's going to be useful to the listeners i think this is where it is very useful which is if you're choosing to work with someone in business make sure they align to your yeah. values first before you decide to work with them yeah so i've got an example from last year yeah let's hear it um and i won't go too specific but we had a situation last year where if you've ever experienced growing a business when you get to certain figures the the biggest problem you're ever going to have in business is cash flow mm -hmm. because you've got to cash flow the VAT, you've got to cash flow the payroll, you've got to cash flow the investment back into the business to help it continue to grow. And so when you get past like the half million pound mark, it becomes a bit of a monster. Mm -hmm. it, it like cash flow is, is a real consideration and you're constantly thinking about, right, okay, how many clients can I bring in to make sure all the investment I'm doing here is paid for and we've got a bit of a buffer for the future. And the perfect storm that that creates is you might let your guard down on the kind of clients you allow into your business mm. and so your qualification gets a little bit ropey you start working with people who perhaps don't tick all the boxes and you start to make excuses for that because it's good for cash flow mm. but what it's not good for is the motivation of the team your own self-worth for profitability all these things and, and what happens is it bites you in the ass when you least expect it so we brought someone on board no names mentioned who maybe ticked half of the boxes that they needed to tick and half ticked a couple of more and definitely didn't tick a couple of the important ones right and we knew that and it was on me and to start with everything went really well we made them a lot of money very quickly but then they didn't back up their side of the bargain because their values didn't align with ours and so some of what they were doing came back to bite them, which inevitably came back to bite us. Right. And I would say, having learned that lesson, it, that if you're in business and being able to sleep at night matters to you, don't fucking do that. Just like hyper-qualify your clients. If they're not a fit or if your gut, for whatever reason, if you can't put your finger on it, but your gut is screaming at you, do not work with this person, just don't. Mm. It, because life's too short. And it, it, it's not necessarily even a business reason. Everything might be fine in the business. But if you're waking up in a cold sweat in the night because something's not quite right, it's not worth it. And and certainly off the back of that, we've had a few clients who questioned our ethics and our and not ethics in the sense that this person was particularly doing anything massively wrong, but mm. just they no longer felt like they were the right fit for us if we were willing to work with someone like that. Understood. So that, and it goes back to the point that we spoke about right at the beginning, which is that energy that you bring in, it might not even be your own. It could be yeah. a client that you should have said no to, but you ended up saying mood yes hoovers. to. Mood That's yeah. what we call <laughs> mood. Mood, I do... <laughs> I've never heard of a mood hoover. I've heard of energy vampires, but... Yeah, yeah, time, vampires, time vampires and mood hoovers. Mood hoovers I'm going to use now yeah. for the rest of my life. If someone walks... You know, like... <laughs> and it's a hard thing to describe, and I'm not, like, a majorly woo-woo guy, but sometimes you can be sat in a room with your back to the entrance, mm. and someone can come into that room and you haven't seen them, but the energy of the room drops. Yeah, do you know... Have you watched Harry Potter? Um... You're going to say no, aren't you? I, I have seen them all. I am I'm by no Fine. means a Harry Potter fan. Do you know the um, Dementors? That, the smoky things. Yeah, that, like, that can suck, suck the life, life out, out of you. you. Yeah, yeah. That is exactly the image I got in my head when you yeah. mentioned that. Yeah, so you, like, I'm sat facing you and someone, a mood hoover's moved, walked in behind me. <laughs> you feel it. Yeah. You know, like it's like the temperature in the room slightly drops. Yeah. All the energy's <laughs> been sucked from the room. And, like, and there's people who are the opposite too. There's mm -hmm. people who, um, like we both know a guy who when he walks into a room, he brings loads of energy into True. the room. 
True. And um, and if he walked into the room and you hadn't seen him, you'd still know he was in the room. Yeah. And I don't know how to quantify that. But yeah. It's just a vibe. It's an energy thing which you can't really define. Yeah. And what the other thing is, mood hoovers are attracted to mood hoovers. <laughs> I've never. So you'll get like a corner of the room. There's like a Dyson, a Henry. <laughs> like they're all hanging out together, <laughs> sucking the life out of the party. <laughs> and. And yeah, I don't know what it is about these pricks and why they all like each other, but you'll find them in little online communities too, mm. where they're like saying snide things about yeah. other communities, but they've got no positives. Yeah. And yeah, like in the marketing world, the, a, a clear alarm bell for one is I've worked with loads of agencies and they were all shit. Mm. Like, hang on, some are shit, but they can't all be shit. Yeah. You've just ticked box number one on the mood hoover checklist understood <laughs> so, yeah you're gonna have to send me that mood hoover checklist yeah, so yeah, i can yeah. use that as well in the future Do, are they called henry yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh man that i never thought i'd ever hear the words mood and hoover together so much in such a short space of yeah time. yeah but you have enlightened me I need today. to bring some energy <laughs> um okay i've got before i go into your social media yeah, because uh, I did a bit of a deep dive and it's something that I started doing recently I find a couple of quotes that I really like and just want to get your take on them Yeah. Um, but before I do you've rubbed shoulders with some pretty huge names Yeah. Uh, both in the marketing space and also not in the marketing space um, obviously Gary Vee is a big one Yeah. Um, but then also correct me if I'm wrong but we've got Snoop Dogg we've got Mila Kunis yeah. and we've got Ice Cube that you went to a basketball game with yeah which it's ridiculous <laughs> and I've got Fair. like I've got no real justification for any of it what do you want to know <laughs> <laughs> um, where do we even start okay what is one thing I would love to know is what has been your biggest takeaway from those people that you've taken as a lesson that you now live by okay this sounds really arrogant mm. um but in all of those situations i've bar one i've spent time with them with p other people that also didn't expect to spend time with them mm. and the biggest takeaway for me was act like you deserve to be there because most people don't oh i love that and you you can really tell so like if you find yourself in a room where you're the smallest person in the room which I would advise if you're growing a business do that a lot mm. act like you deserve to be there because the moment you don't everyone knows and it's that whole like pe people aren't savages but they can smell blood mm. and the moment that you try and be like oh it's alright for you because you're you're much more successful than me and I'll be like fuck off like <laughs> I don't need to spend time nurturing you. I've got other shit to do. Mm. And, and there are kind people out there that will put their arm around you, but you're never going to reach the position in that you want. So I've yeah, I've really found myself in, in like weird situations in the last couple of years where, like you say, sat next to Ice Cube at basketball. I was like, oh my God. Like, <laughs> that's Ice Cube. And then... And then I was like, don't act like that because everyone else is. And when mm. people were like asking him for selfies, because what happened was loads of people asked, were asking him for selfies and asking him for, for a piece of him. Mm. And I didn't. I sat there and I was nice to his family and I was polite and I was polite to the people around me and then got invited to the after party because I was the only one not acting like a lunatic. Nice. And, <laughs> and so, and then other people got invited because of that and yeah. it was good but yeah the takeaway was try and act like you deserve to be there even though it's really really hard the moment you start acting starstruck and then like the second takeaway is ask yourself what can you do for them because nobody does that mm. everyone else is trying to take a piece everyone wants something yeah so when when I properly met Gary V for the first time um, I'd, I'd spoken to him before face to face but it, it was like I'd queued to chat to him this time he was coming to a place where I was waiting to actually meet him 
and I was like right I'm going to give him a gift because no one else is mm. going to so I, I put together like a code break shock and awe box but then I know he loves sport and I, I knew he knew about um, Wrexham and, yep. and Ryan Reynolds yep. taking over Wrexham and I was like right I, I need Gary V to remember who I am I need to pull off something here where I'm giving him something but he'll also never forget it and so I support Shrewsbury Town and Shrewsbury Town are Wrexham's main rival <laughs> so I was like right I'm going to go to Shrewsbury Town and get Gary 5 as in Gary V yep. printed on the back of a Shrewsbury Town kit and when I meet Gary V I'm going to tell him the story how, of how I'm going to fuck over Ryan Reynolds nice and so everyone in this meeting there was like 20 of us max most people are like Gary how do I how many times a day should I post on Facebook or like I'm trying to get my TikTok off the ground. Will you come on a live with me? And obviously he has to say no. And I come up to him and give him this box and he opens it. And he's like, what's this? And I was like, we're uh, Wrexham's arch rivals and I'm going to fuck Ryan Reynolds. And he, he was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> but now I've been on calls with him since and he, know, he knows my name. He knows yeah. who I am. And, and I've pulled similar things like um, Jesse Itzler is an entrepreneur that I mm -hmm. really really like and um, and I've done a few bits with him and one of the things he talks about on stage is the first time he needed to get people into his jet company he wasn't actually allowed into the conference where he was mm -hmm. going to get people into his jet company but he noticed everybody was buying muffins from the coffee shop outside before they went in for their breakfast so the next day he went to the coffee shop and bought all the muffins and then stood two doors down from the coffee shop and offered people a muffin as they came past genius and made made loads of comments and stuff and, and so i knew jesse was talking at a talk and i and i messaged jesse privately and said jesse if you don't give me five minutes the next time you're at such and such i'm gonna throw muffins at you until you do <laughs> and he knew the reference and so um then the next time we were on a zoom call with other people he came to me and he was like oh hey joel and i was like yes nailed it like there's a clip for my content there you I go. gave him something first it came back to me excellent stuff I love that absolutely love that that's a huge huge takeaway uh, for anyone listening who wants to connect with people who are on a higher profile um, just do your research and act like a human yeah act like you deserve to be there yeah. and consider the rule of reciprocity love that so. right into your socials okay. so I got uh, here we go <laughs> don't worry it's nothing bad oh no uh, <laughs> I hope it is let's get um, cancelled I got <laughs> I got three quotes um, two of which were actually from people who you've had on your podcast and one was your own okay and in, do I need to guess which one's which you don't need to guess which one's which don't worry <laughs> good because that would put you in a very embarrassing spot if you didn't know who said yeah, what <laughs> yeah 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 when did you last talk bollocks yeah which one was you <laughs> um what I'd love is kind of like your one sentence takeaway from their quote and why you even bothered posting okay. it. Okay. So the first one is where most people give up is where successful people start. Okay. What's your takeaway from that? It's true. Um, and loads of people say that quote. I think like Alex Hormozzi is very famous mm -hmm. for saying that quote. Um, but when it feels its absolute worst, you're probably past the point where most people have already quit. And like other famous quotes, the darkest day comes mm -hmm. before the, the darkest time comes before the dawn, blah, yep. blah, blah, blah. Your your success is on the other side of that discomfort. And I think the reality is most people aren't able to go through a little bit of discomfort. Like take take me, for example, you know, rather than criticizing others, I know in order to get fitter I need to go to the gym consistently but right now I'm not if, if you take that analogy and apply it to business most people aren't willing to do the reps to achieve what they want to achieve if you are you're ahead of 99% of the competition love that second one if you're fulfilled it doesn't matter if you've had a positive day or a negative day it's just another day in the journey so that's my quote it is <laughs> so yeah I think if you fill your life with experiences that make you feel fulfilled and by fulfilled I don't necessarily mean happy a lot of people chase happiness mm -hmm. and I think that the problem with happiness is that 
there's an equal opposite to happiness mm -hmm. and you will end up feeling it so actually fulfillment so if you climb a mountain and look at the view the feeling isn't one of immense happiness it's kind of an of immense fulfillment you're looking at something that makes you feel incredible but it's not happiness it's different mm -hmm. and if you can find ways to get that fulfillment now for me walking the dog gives me that like i I love my dog to bits. It's a nice connection. Going for a walk with him always makes me feel better. Um, it could be something as simple as like an ice cold glass of water. It could be something as mad as like going on a track day. Mm -hmm. Like, But if you're keeping yourself fulfilled, when bad shit happens, it just doesn't hit the same way. And equally, when good stuff happens, you don't get this like ego-led feeling that you need to go and boast about it and tell people, oh, I've just done this amazing mm -hmm. thing. Because it's it's sort of petty compared to how fulfilled you feel and i don't know the answer to how you keep yourself full but for me it's about making sure that i've got enough experiences in my life things going on away from the daily grind that make me feel good and the people that i love feel good that is beautifully put final one so many businesses are thinking short term that they're missing the opportunities right in front of them. Yeah. So, not, again, 99% of the business owners I know are thinking about how much money they're going to make today, in the next week, in the next month. They're not thinking about how much impact am I going to have in the next year, two years, five years, that a byproduct of that positive impact will be income into my business. And the difference being, when you start making short-term decisions, you start making mistakes. So like I referenced before about not qualifying a client mm -hmm. properly. Um, you might cut corners on a job. You might work with a supplier that's slightly cheaper because it's good for that month. Yeah. But then your technology fails or something doesn't go to plan or your parcels don't arrive in the right condition or whatever it might be. And the long-term impact of that is negative. Mm -hmm. Where if you can flip it and start thinking about, okay, well, what foundations can I lay today that future Joel will thank me for? And and I talk about this in the office to the team sometimes, and, and they think I'm crazy, which is partly true. <laughs> um, but I'll be like, they're like, why have you done that? I was like, future Joel will thank me for it. Or like on a night out, a great one is like, if you have a glass of water as your last drink, future Joel will thank me for that. I love that. And it sounds a bit boring but it makes such a difference because you start to compound these little wins into what the long term looks mm -hmm. like and so with with our team we always pack down the office so it looks clean and tidy ready for the next day because future co-break will thank us for it mm. and we always make sure that we've got our priority list done ready for the next day because future co-break will thank us for it and when you compound those little things over time, the long term looks so much clearer mm -hmm. and so much easier. And then people start saying things to you like, oh, you were an overnight success. And I was like, no, I wasn't. No, no, I've been planning for my overnight success because my future self has been thanking me for what I've been yeah. doing for the last three years. Yeah, yeah. I love that. And I've been doing all these boring, monotonous things because future Joel will thank me for it. Yeah. And then, you know, like with me, and I'm sure like listeners are getting a bit of an insight now, they'll be like your spreadsheets are quite detailed i'm like well they weren't to start with yeah. it's just i was working hard for future joel so that i would know what my cash flow position is i would know what i need to do in terms of how many leads i need next month how many leads i need next year how much i need to spend on ads blah 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 and so now it looks like i'm an incredibly weird spreadsheet geek but actually <laughs> it's the compound effect of all the effort over the last 15 years love it mate well Final four questions for you. Okay. And these are quick fire. Okay. To wrap up what has been an absolutely incredible uh, episode for sure. So first one, mm -hmm. what do you think is the most essential skill that someone needs to succeed in today's world? In the world, mm -hmm. so not business. Business, uh, could be business, could be personal, could be anything. I think the most successful people that I've met all have incredible communication skills so they're able to get more from someone than anyone else is through their ability to communicate 
that might be on a business level that might be on a personal level but they they're very good at making the person that they're asking to do something feel special mm-hmm. I think that's smart um, they mean it which compounds the fact that they've made that person feel special they communicate it in a succinct and direct way mm-hmm. so that very often they don't have to say much to get the message across and they make the person feel empowered when they do it and so they can then achieve a lot more in the day week month than a normal person because they've got all these people running through brick walls for them love it yeah great answer this podcast is called the mindful creator yep what does being mindful mean to you and how do you practice it So the big one for me is about being present. So as much as I bang on about future, Joel will thank me for it and I've had a difficult past and blah, blah, blah. The simplicity of focusing on the task at hand is also really important. And the task at hand might be to just sit and enjoy the moment, whatever it is. Uh, Things I practice actively to pull myself back into the moment if my wife's not there to do it for me. Yeah. (laughs) This is a bit of cognitive behavioural therapy. But every time I boil the kettle, I stand and listen to it boil. I love that. Something so simple. Yeah. And that will immediately bring you back to centre. Um, exercise is a good one. Sometimes it's noticing things that other people haven't noticed. So if you're on out for a walk, how many... like my, Again, this has come from my wife, but how many different types of birds can I spot? I might not know what they are. I might not care what they are. But... It's something to make me active in the moment to take me away from particularly thinking about the past. I don't you can't control what's already happened, so good to pull yourself back to center. Love it. What is the most impactful book or movie that has had a Ooh. significant uh impact on your life? Book or movie? Wow. Loads. Only one. Loads. Okay. So I'm I'm going to go Rocky 2. Okay. Nice. So I could have gone real deep. Yeah. And pick, pick, pick like, you know. I mean, the whole Rocky story is super deep in itself anyway with Sly, the way he pitched his... Um, yeah. The way he pitched his script and all of that. But go on, what's your well, takeaway? Well, my that? worry is that people who aren't like Sly geeks might not realise that actually he kind of did it all himself mm. and that the films have got quite a bit more depth to them, particularly 1 and 2 mm-hmm. and 6. <laughs> Then, the, yeah. So in Rocky Two, basically he's lost in Rocky One, which some of you may not know. Spoiler alert! But he did very well, and he's fought the world champion when he was a nobody. And the world champion is now getting like hate mail and racist mm. mail, and uh, feels like he might not be as good as he thought he was. So he really wants a rematch to humiliate Rocky and show the world how good he is. And Rocky's kind of not interested. He's reached the pinnacle. He would like went toe to toe with the world champion. His family don't want him to do it. He's got a damaged eye, um, so there's a there's a medical risk doing it. Uh, his wife's pregnant, and he, yeah, like the only reason to do it would be ego. Mm. And then, um his wife and and his wife's brother have an altercation and she falls into a coma while she's pregnant and he doesn't quite know what to do and when she comes round she says I want you to do something for me and he's like why anything he's like win and when I'm as sad as it might sound when I'm struggling I think of that and think I want you to do something for me win and what does winning look like and it certainly isn't letting covid get you or terrible things happen Mm. to you or giving up on your family and that has really impacted everything i do because when i play sport i play to win when i play business i play to win when i play a board game ask my wife i play to win and it's not necessarily the most beautiful trait but but it works and it and it gets me places and like you say i've been fortunate enough to meet people who in my view i i had no right to meet i managed to put myself in situations where i'm winning and and i'll continue to do that and 
Rocky 2 inspires that love it last question for you if you could go back to one point in your past mm -hmm. and give your younger self only one piece of advice mm. what age would you go back to and what would you say I'd probably go so the first time I had a suicidal thought I was five or six and I know it really panicked my mum at the time and a lot of that was built around learnt sensitivity so um, I like the whole like sticks and stones will break my bones but words will never hurt me not true words really hurt and I like kids had realised that I was a sensitive kid so they picked on me but not like in hindsight not so bad that i should have quite reacted like i did but i learned to be sensitive and i was really struggling with that it was really getting me down i was overthinking it and if i could go back to that kid now and like you know me people have seen me in some pretty serious scenarios and i don't take life that seriously mm. which seems strange considering everything i said on this podcast but if i go back to that five six year old and say at the end of the day none of this really matters mm. like we're only here for a tiny tiny amount of time and just do what's right and have fun whilst you're doing it and everything else will kind of figure itself out I think that would be like really strong advice and now I'm like willing to walk into scenarios where maybe I'm the least important person in the room per se and crack jokes and be me and I, I like that I love it Joel this has been an absolutely fantastic episode and I just want to say thank you so much for thank you for having me sharing everything that you shared it's no been trouble. huge